Pit Boer. Um, I was the project architect on Soccer City. I was, I've been involved in the project from about 2006, where we start with the design and followed it through until you see the final built product that is there today. I'm also one of the partners in Buchtman & Partners, a fairly big architectural firm in South Africa. Well, we've been involved with the old FMB stadium for quite a few years. Um, my personal involvement was essentially from 2006, from when we won the bid for the 2010 World Cup. Um, and at that stage, we started with 10 different designs of the stadium to always try and put a, or place an iconic stadium there um, on request of the city and on request of the government. So we went about the whole process of designing these 10 different ideas or developing 10 different ideas for what the stadium could possibly be. And it varied from various concepts of the Pratia or the bowl or the mine dumps, all aspects of Africa or Southern Africa or even Johannesburg that gets incorporated into the stadium and in an attempt to place an icon there that everybody can relate to. And when we presented the 10 different ideas to Danny or Don, his immediate option was for the African pot as the most recognizable icon for the whole of Africa as a unifying element and as something that everybody can share in. And from there, which was at that stage a very, very basic idea, we developed it to what you see there today. Our tender process, we've been involved in the stadium from about um, 2000, where we've done various options on what the stadium could be at that stage, how it could be upgraded um, for a bigger capacity and how it could be bettered um, to get better sight lines, to get better functionality in terms of services and all of that. And we were also involved in the designs that we included in the bid books, the first bid book for the 2006 World Cup and then the bid book for the 2010 World Cup, which is finally the one that we won. So after South Africa was awarded the World Cup, our appointment was essentially extended from all the work that we have previously did for the stadium and it was formalized on that basis. Um, we worked on risk from 2000 till after we started building on site. So until then there was no fees ever earned. It was uh, on a risk basis and we were appointed effectively after the contractor. Um, the stadium was built on a JBCC contract um, with a few addendums to it, but it was the standard JBCC agreement, um, which works for the South African environment very well. We had quite a few international contractors as well, which had to be educated essentially on how the JBCC works, and especially, especially in the local environment of how you deal with subcontractors and where the design responsibilities lie, because it's fairly different from the process they would follow, let's say, in Europe. Because the time frame that we had to design and develop the stadium was so extremely limited, we had to ve work very, very closely with the structural engineers and the mechanical and electrical and the entire team to develop the stadium as a unit. Um, so it's not just an architectural solution where we went out, decided what needs to happen, and then everybody needs to implement their systems. It's a cohesive, holistic approach that we followed where everybody was part of the process to develop the stadium and to make it as cost effective as possible. So we worked very closely firstly with Hans Guren of PDNA and Frank Simon of Schleich Bergemann and Partners in Germany um, to develop a structure that incorporates our idea of what this African pot should be um, with a minimum of structure that you have to place there and it just becomes part of this pot that we created. So it's, it's one thing. It's not one thing supported by another thing. It's a unit. And the same goes for all the other systems that we introduced into the building. Um, it's all linked together very well, which is quite fortunate. It's got a lot of memory to the old stadium. Um, so what we did in the design is we kept as much as we possibly could, which effectively in the end was the piling structures all the way around the stadium and the western stand we managed to keep three of the slabs and the columns that was there. Unfortunately the rest of the stadium was not really usable so we had to redo the embankments, we had to redo the upper tier on the western side and all the services and everything else we had to 
essentially take out and do away with and install new. Um, what it did do, however, is it gave us opportunity to keep some of the memory of the old stadium. So we, what, we painted all of the old aspects of the stadium a dark grey colour as part of the memory, so one can always see what the stadium was and what's left over of the original, and it's still in the same position. In retrospect, I think it would have been more cost-effective to build a new stadium next door um, because you can work with much better efficiencies, you can have different spans, less columns, um, your precast could be completely different modules, um, your dynamic loads would be different, so, and you can wrap the stadium much tighter around the pitch, so you reduce the amount of sod area, reduce the amount of roof. Um, but because the stadium has so much memory, I think it's the right decision to upgrade what was there um, to what we've got now. And the other important thing is because this is in the piece of land that sits in between the CBD of Johannesburg and Soweto, and which was essentially no man's land previously, this now acts as a very good catalyst for that area to develop and to link the city and Soweto as a unit again. As part of the vehicle access, this, the old FMB stadium was already built on the intersection of what's essentially the M2 and the N1 Western Bypass. So it's very well connected in that sense. But to get from those two highways to the stadium was a bit difficult because you could only take Rancho Road um, or the Nazarek off ramp. So additional off-ramp was built, which is an extension of the N17 highway, which in future will ex be extended all the way through. But from the N1, you've got this additional off-ramp that's introduced, which gives much better vehicular access. And there's numerous roads built around the stadium, including the Golden Highway, which is a link between Rancho Road at the moment and the N17 which gives you much better accessibility to the Nazarek precinct or the Nazarek arena. Um, we also built a whole transport hub which can incorporate or does incorporate buses, it incorporates bus rapid transport and taxis and then there's a station facility as well for the metro rail which is an existing station that was upgraded and is linked into the transport hub that we built. And on the northern side of the, sta of the stadium, there's an additional BRT station that was built. Um, so we can accommodate about 75% of the people that come to the stadium with public transport um, quite easily within the two hours before a match. And that equates to about 70,000 people that you bring in with public transport, which is quite efficient. And that's not with the additional park and rides that can be introduced as and when required. For the stadium itself, um, to get into the stadium is one thing and one can design for it, but the biggest risk is to get people out of the stadium in, in case of emergency. So in terms of regulations, you need to get to a place of safety within eight minutes. So the entire stadium is designed on an evacuation basis so that you can get every person to a place of safety within eight minutes, which on the lower embankments mean that you need to get them out up to the pit of fire, which is the security line around the stadium. And for the upper tier, it means you need to get out from the upper tier to the ramp structures, which essentially sits away from any risk that might, might be there. And so far, from all the tests, it seems that it's been working very well. For ingress, your biggest queuing distance is in terms of the turnstiles and where people come from, because you've got most of the people with public transport coming from the south, uh, uh, from the transport hub and over the promenade. We've got a lot more tr turnstiles installed on that side, but you can also um, access the stadium all the way around. So we've got movement paths all the way around the stadium so that you can access any side of the stadium that you might need to. Um, so if your seats are on the north and you arrive at the south, you can move around the outside or you can go through the turnstiles on the southern side and move around the stadium on the inside within the secure perimeter. So it makes the whole stadium much more accessible. We've also got about 26 entrances on lower concourse level and then eight ramps that can take you up to the upper, upper levels of the stadium. Part of the old stadium used to incorporate 
incorporate an old moat, which was a security feature that was designed and it was seen as a good security measure to prevent people from getting onto the pitch um, previously. Nowadays that's frowned upon. So what we did is we enclosed the entire moat with a slab and waterproofed the entire inside to create a big water reservoir where we can save about three and a half million litres of water, um, which we can then use to irrigate the pitch which yeah, takes about 100,000 litres a day, or we can use it to flush the ablutions on the lower concourse level, so for embankment concourse and lower concourse. Um, so it's just saving as much water as you possibly can. So we're collecting all the water that falls in the roof opening, so whatever falls onto the pitch or into the bowl, and then about three quarters of the water that falls onto the roof gets collected and um, tunneled into the moat itself. And then for the rest of the grounds we've got attenuation ponds on the northern side which can collect most of the water. It's got permanent water in it as well so that you create a bit of a wetland ecosystem there to essentially control the amount of water that would fall into the normal sewer lines. We followed the green goal as set out by FIFA as one of the requirements and that deals with a few aspects. So it's waste, it's energy, it's transport. Um, there's quite a few, I can't remember all of them. So in terms of transport, we looked at it definitely in terms of the public transport, and how we get people to the stadium and away, back from the stadium again. In terms of waste, we've got a whole waste methodology of how you collect waste within the stadium, how you can separate it. We've got compactors on site, we've got sorting tables on site. Um, we can split between dry waste and waste wa wet waste and just try and recycle as much as possible. Um, in terms of the building itself, we also crushed all of the existing bricks on site, or well, not all of them, we crushed all the existing paving on site to use in the layer work, so we had to cut in ma less material to site. The existing bricks was cleaned on site and made available to the local community. Um, we tried to reuse all the components of the old stadium within the stadium layer works or within components of the stadium as well. Even excavated soil, we tried to use as much of it on site, to just creating berms and features rather than carting everything away. In terms of energy, I think we've been fairly efficient. Um, we've got energy um, efficient lights throughout the stadium. So all the concourses has compact fluorescent lights, um, the outside areas. Um, the stadium, the main stadium lights works on a building management system where you can adjust them according to the television requirements that are there for a specific match. So if you've got high dev television then you need 2000 lux across the entire pitch. If it's normal television then you need 1500 lux. So you can adjust the light levels accordingly and redu reduce the amount of energy that you effectively use. We try to recycle as much water as we possibly can, as mentioned earlier. And then in terms of materials, the facade is made of a fiber reinforced concrete panel, which has a life expectancy of about 60 years. It's color through, it's got no maintenance requirements whatsoever. And it can be fully recycled after the stadium is decomm decommissioned. The structure for the roof is all steel, which is completely recyclable, recyclable. And then the concrete, although it's more difficult to recycle because of the steel content in there, it can still be reused in certain instances. Well, interestingly enough, um, some of the bigger loads on the stadium is wind loads and the stadium trying to be sucked out of the ground. So we did extensive wind tunnel testing in a small town called Kobelmoor in Germany, um, where they developed or they built a whole model and through the wind tunnel testing we could calculate what the forces on each side of the stadium would be. And what we realized is that I think it's about a 500 ton uplift per core. We've got 12 cores around the stadium that is generated. So we had to introduce tension piles um, for the main roof supports that go down 30 meters into or to the bedrock and then another cables that are grouted in another 8 meters into the bedrock below. And those cables would go all the way back into the roof structure to keep the entire stadium down, which was quite an interesting feat. And Okay, the outside structure is essentially split into three sections, uh, or four sections. 
So the first section from the ground to upper tier level or upper concourse level is a concrete structure and that acts as a cage around the whole stadium. There's steel tie beams that sit in between every concrete column and that acts as a cage holding the whole stadium together. That's made in concrete because all our ramps are suspended from there and it becomes the link between um, the outside face of the pot and the existing stadium structure. So you've got that dialogue of the two structures that has to take place and concrete was the log logical choice in terms of program and just in terms of how the structural systems would work. Because in sections you've got ramps connected into it, in sections you've got normal suspended slabs connected to the facade itself. So from the upper tier or upper concourse up, it's a very simple steel s structure, which is essentially a steel cage again. Um, uh, it's 400 by 400 eight sections that go all the way to a spatial ring truss, which sits around the stadium. And it's connected at top and bottom with pivot connections, so it can move independently from the rest of the structure. Um, at the top, it's supported by the spatial ring truss, which is the main structural element of the roof. It's about 800 meters long. It's a big triangular space frame um, that supports the 37 meter cantilever on the one side and the facade on the other side and takes up all the wind loads. It takes up the weight of the whole structure of 7,800 tons of steel in the roof itself um, and it transfers it to 12 columns that, or 12 structural shafts around the stadium. And those are the same shafts that will deal with load and with wind load in certain instances as well. Uh, my name is Hans Kuren. I'm a director of PD Knighting Associates, uh, Consulting Engineers. Uh, we were in the fortunate position that we were appointed as uh, principal structural engineers on the uh, Soccer City Stadium. Uh, we appointed as our sub-consultants a company by the name of Schleich, Bergemann and Partners, uh, a German company who are specialist uh, structural steel and facade uh, specialists. Um, we appointed them to uh, assist us with the design of the roof and the facade structures. Uh, Soccer City was, uh, was uh, obviously a very uh, complicated structure to deal with. We dealt with an existing pavilion uh, which had limitations in load-bearing capacity. We therefore had to uh, strengthen some of the existing uh, pavilion, uh, parts of the existing pavilion. Um, the existing pavilion was retained for, for various reasons, one of them being historical reasons and at that stage, in the initial parts of the contract, um, everyone believed that, the, uh, that we would save money by retaining the existing pavilion. Uh, this, however, proved not to be so. I think it would have been cheaper to, to demolish it and rebuild it. Um, so we had to deal with, uh, with massive forces which uh, we are generated from dead load, obviously, and live load on the, on the pavilion structures, uh, as well as uh, wind loads. The uh, facade structure attracts a lot of wind. Uh, wind load um, and some of it is obviously uplift in certain conditions, certain load combinations and all these loads in different combinations had to be catered for and uh, obviously transferred safely uh, into the foundations. Uh, some of the foundations attracted uh, uplift forces of uh, 5,800 kilonewtons and downward uh, compressive forces of 10,000 kilonewtons, massive forces that we had to deal with in very, very large moments. Um, and due to varying soil conditions on site, uh, we, we had various founding options which we adapted as, uh, as, as these became apparent. Um, to deal with the uplift uh, forces on the foundations, we, uh, we had to put in tension piles. Uh, some of these piles in certain cases went down 33 meters into, into the ground. And then there were still uh, dewey dag uh, bars that were dulled further 6 meters into rock. Um, some of the piles were 1.5 meters in diameter. Uh, another big challenge uh, on the project was the, uh, uh, was the facade columns. There are 120 facade columns which uh, uh, are constructed uh, around the stadium. Um, these facade columns take all the uh, facade vertical and horizontal loads as well as obviously the, the wind loads as well. Um, and they are uh, eccentric to the base. The top of the facade column is about 17 meters uh, above the base and horizontally about six and a half meters away from the base. 
um, which obviously uh, in its uh, static state um, attracts huge moments and uh, once again uplift in the, in the foundations. Um, these, uh, these facade columns uh, also proved to be a challenge to construct uh, because of the very large uh, content of reinforcing steel in the columns. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, I think there was about 800 kilograms per cubic meter of reinforcement in these columns, which means, uh, which obviously made it very difficult to compact the columns with normal poker vibration. Um, and uh, the contractor, which was Grinica LTA Inter Beton Joint Venture, uh, opted to use uh, self-compacting concrete. Um, the, the concrete strengths in these columns uh, after three days was approximately 40 MPa, very, very high strength concrete and very durable as well. Um, another big challenge on the project was the, um, the design of the shafts. The entire roof structure is supported on uh, 12, 12 large shafts. Uh, these shafts vary in uh, plan dimension and once again they attract all the horizontal vertical loads from the roof and these are then taken down into the foundations which I described earlier which has got tension and compression piles. Uh, the shaft uh, walls were on average about 500 to 600 millimeters thick. Uh, also very dense uh, reinforcement, I think up to 450 kilograms a cubic meter. Um, and the compaction of, uh, of these walls was also a challenge for the contractor but in the end the, uh, the quality that was obtained was of a very high standard. Um, the existing pavilion um, between uh, Bochetman Urban Edge Architects and ourselves, um, it was agreed that the sight lines had to be improved. Um, a very uh, detailed uh, investigation of the sight lines was undertaken by the architects and it was decided that the existing pavilion on the western side, um, the uh, sight lines had to be improved and therefore we removed all the precast seating elements on the, on the upper tier. Uh, improved the rake uh, of, of the existing um, pavilion and, uh, and put new precast seating elements uh, onto, onto the structure. Um, there were also, it was also found with detailed surveys which only became apparent after the contractor had started on site um, that uh, there were many discrepancies on the existing pavilion which had to be dealt with. Um, the new structure in relation to the old structure, we discovered that there was a rotation. So we, uh, during the construction stages, uh, and this was, apparent, this was unfortunately not picked up before construction started, but it resulted in us having to design transfer beams uh, to, to ensure that the rotation was dealt with. And we furthermore picked up that the uh, existing pavilion uh, was not level um, and therefore leveling screeds had to be introduced. Uh, these leveling screeds uh, attracted a lot of additional load once again, so the existing structure also had to be uh, checked and made sure that all the existing load could be catered for. And in fact, there was quite a bit of uh, strengthening required on the existing pavilion. Uh, we used quite a bit of uh, carbon strips uh, as supplied by Sika, um, which, uh, which efficiently dealt with uh, tension zones in the concrete where we couldn't uh, introduce additional reinforcement. Um, we also did quite a few load tests on the existing piles. Um, quality control on the stadium we found to be extremely important and we did numerous tests. I think, uh, I believe at Soccer City we probably did more tests than uh, any of the other stadiums. Um, these included uh, static and dynamic um, uh, load tests on the seating elements and uh, we wanted to ensure that the seating elements um, would have a, high, a natural frequency higher than 6 Hz as, uh, as recommended by the Green Guide. Um, these were undertaken at Wits University uh, in the laboratory and we found that on average the natural frequencies were about 12, 12 Hz, so uh, well above what the minimum requirement was. Uh, we did, uh, as I said, we did quite a few static load tests as well on the seating elements. The design static load was 500 kilograms a square meter. Uh, as required by the code and these elements failed in the region of 4,000 kilograms a square meter, so uh, well above the uh, design load and they are extremely slender. These elements were about 80 millimeters thick on the horizontal element but the uh, strength and, and uh, the transferring of loads is obviously via the vertical element which was about 100 millimeters thick. The spans in general varied uh, they were quite small, they vary between 5.3 meters to probably 6.5 meters if I, if I remember correctly. 
Uh, we also did um, uh, to ensure that everything complied with the green guide. We did a, lo a lot of horizontal load testing on, on the walls, uh, on, on balustrades. We did, uh, uh, we did load testing, tension load testing on piles. Uh, we obviously couldn't um, simulate the, the large forces that uh, were required because there's just no equipment available to do that. But uh, uh, WITS University once again assisted us with that and we uh, did dial tests uh, in rock to ensure that the dials could transmit the loads that we required. Uh, compressive tests were also done. We also did load tests on the existing uh, slabs and uh, all of these tests passed which obviously gives a lot of comfort and we knew that the stadium uh, would be durable and would be, a, be able to accommodate uh, all the loads that it was designed for. And uh, I think uh, after the uh, successful South Af World Cup at South Africa hosted, uh, it's evidenced uh, that all the stadiums in, in South Africa were designed properly. Okay, the lifts are, for lack of a better word, in the corners of the stadium, um, even though it's a round structure, but the bowl is fairly square. So most of the lifts are positioned in the corners, part of a circulation core where you can get up and down from the lower concourse to the suite levels and to the upper concourse as well. And each corner we've got two lifts, one for um, public access or for suite owners and for people that would access the upper concourse level. Um, and the second lift is for maintenance and for serviceability of the stadium. And that one would act as a fireman's lift as well. So these lift structures with the staircase in between them became fairly structural components that kept the stadium upright as well. So it's very nice stuff elements that one could place there and it allowed us to give um, numerous flexibility in the way the stadium could be accessed and it just reduced the distances um, for somebody to get to a specific suite. So those work fairly well. We've also got two lifts that link the lower basement level with all the other levels and especially with the hospitality area on the upper concourse western side and in, in the basement it links directly to the main kitchen um, of the stadium. So it allows additional flexibility of the stadium to be used for other events, for instance weddings, conferences, all sorts of other events that is enabled because you've got this connectivity from the main services of, or the main kitchen in the stadium. Um, the western side also has two lifts just to service the VVIP and VIP levels of the stadium to the basement. In terms of the budget, the final construction value of the stadium was 3.38 billion rand, which um, is extremely cost effective still. I mean, it's much more than what the original budget for the stadium was, but it is, when you count it or calculate it as cost per seat, it's one of the most cost effective stadiums in the world, especially of a stadium this size, um, because the costs go up exponentially the bigger the stadium gets, because your cantilevers become bigger, your areas around the stadium just become so much bigger to cope with the tremendous amount of people that you've got. Um, so it definitely was a cost-effective stadium. The original tender value was 1 .1, yeah, 1.916 um, billion and so there's been a, quite a bit of creep from there but it's not as if the design changed um, anywhere through the process. That was the basic build contract but all the other components got added as we went along and unfortunately it was in the big rise of the construction industry still so costs did escalate quite a bit. Quite a bit. The design scope however didn't really change that much. Um, there was quite a few items that we incorporated as part of the FIFA requirements but yeah, essentially the scope stayed the same. It was value that changed. In terms of suppliers, um, what was quite interesting and it's the first time we've ever dealt with it on such a scale is that you could actually access the international market for products at more cost effective rates than locally because of the volumes. Um, the local industry wasn't necessarily geared to deal with volumes of that nature. So you could go to the international market and because their systems are set up in such a way you could get same, similar materials or even better materials at much lesser cost. In terms of experience, in South Africa we 
don't have the luxury to specialize in a specific field like you might have in Europe. Um, so we masters of all trades in the architectural profession within our firm. And if something like the stadium comes across our path, you have to go on a learning curve. And it was a massive learning curve to learn how to build and develop a stadium like this and to make sure that you comply to all the international regulation. So between myself and my partner, Bob van Beber, we went through this learning curve and just made sure that we know what all the requirements of a stadium is. And we also contracted with um, a company called HOK at this, that stage, they're populist now, to assist us on a technical basis and to make sure that we comply to all the international regulations related to sports and events venues. Um, so they came down about once a month and checked all our drawings, made sure we comply to the British standards, to the green guide, which was quite an important guide for us in terms of design, and to any, any other regulations that there might be, or just good practice that there might be. But otherwise, it was us and our team, and we had to learn. We had a very small core team of people, very senior people within our office that dealt with the project, specifically because um, with the time frames, you don't want to go and manage 50 people or 30 people or whatever. So we kept it as small as possible with the most experienced people that we had available in our, in our office to develop this thing to what it is today. Um, and if we had to have more people, then suddenly you've got more management, you actually start losing, losing efficiency in the process. So our motto was to keep it as small and tighten it as possible and just make sure it gets done correctly the first time around. Um, the w one of the biggest lessons learned uh, on this project, well there's a few lessons learned. Um, from the start, I think we, uh, we weren't afforded enough time to do all our designs and investigations. Uh, the wind tunnel testing was commissioned um, at a very late stage. In fact, it was commissioned a month before the contractor moved into site. So a lot of the uh, forces for which we had to design only became apparent once the contractor was in site, uh, which made everything quite a challenge, obviously, to ensure that everything was catered for properly. Another big lesson learnt, um, and these things are always very easy to, to uh, discuss retrospectively, um, it was impossible to have known this initially, but um, it probably would have been easier, cheaper, quicker to have demolished the existing grandstand. We, uh, we picked up uh, quite a few problems and challenges, and I think a, a couple of delays and uh, also uh, budget, budget jumps uh, due to us having retained the existing structure. We managed it. Um, uh, but it took a lot of, uh, a lot of man hours uh, within the company and I think uh, a couple of uh, divorces uh, were looming um, the way we carried on. Uh, fortunately we all survived and uh, we've got a fantastic project. A huge uh, portion of the project's success was certainly the, uh, the very, very good teamwork between uh, primarily the architects Burkhardman Urban Edge and Partners uh, ourselves as structure engineers, uh, PD-19 Associates, and then also the contractor, Grinike LTA, into Beton. Uh, we had a very good uh, working relationship uh, from, the, from the very beginning, and uh, we, we managed, we had uh, technical meetings every single Monday uh, at the architect's offices, uh, in which we dealt future uh, challenges on the project and made sure that these were dealt with uh, on time. Um, and then on Thursdays we had uh, technical meetings every single Thursday on site as well and this is where we uh, addressed current issues on site and challenges. Uh, it was a great uh, working relationship and um, I think if it wasn't for that this project wouldn't have been a success as it was. As a whole um, I think the process was actually quite rewarding because you built friendships and you built relationships with people because you worked so tightly together with them for four years that yeah, I think it's the friendships that were lost. What was also quite nice is that for the first time we worked with international contractors on such a close-knit basis and for them it was an interesting experience of how the South African market works um, where it's not just about litigation, you actually go out there to make a plan to develop this thing together and to get it built because the contractor that has to build it must have as much say in it as the engineer and the architect and everybody else to get to the right solution in the end of the day. 
I think that's one of the nice elements of a project like that, is that everybody in the team could be involved in such a way that they became part of the process. I'll do it faster, because <laughs> now I know how <laughs> <I> to. <do. laughs> um, the one thing I would probably change is, and I won't elaborate it on, on it too much, but we'll require appointments to be directly to the city who is effectively outlined. Contractually, make sure that all your contracts are drafted by a lawyer beforehand and don't try and do it yourself because that's just dangerous um, and it gets you in a lot of hot water. Um, from a money perspective, I mean, it's a big project, there's big money involved in it, it just managing the process correctly. Um, but the risks are also huge involved in a process like this because you make one small mistake and it gets repeated 20,000 times. Um, one bolt that's specified wrong and you've got 50,000 bolts on site that can't be used. So you have to be meticulous in whatever you do, contractually and in the implementation of everything. It has to be meticulous all the way through. Um, so that's probably the most critical item in building a big structure. Fortunately, South Africa is not as legally inclined as the rest of the world initially in a project. I think in the end we end up in the same way, so it's the same lawsuits and everything else. But initially you can work together in, this, in a very good way to get a very good product out there very quickly. Whereas internationally I think it takes a bit more of your time to deal with all the legal aspects in the initial phases when you should actually focus on getting the, the design out and getting the building built. Yeah, I think in terms of what the design is in the end, I don't think we'll change anything. I think the product that is there is, has become what it's supposed to be. It's one of the icons of Africa and the icon of South Africa and definitely one of the key elements of the World Cup. And I think everybody um, of Johannesburg especially and probably South Africa has taken ownership of what the stadium is and that's what we really set out to do. So. In terms of efficiencies, I think we can program it differently, we can document the building differently, and we'll probably implement different systems we did, which we didn't have the luxury to do when we started with the project. But yeah, I think it's all about efficiencies. We can do it quicker and faster and better this time around. Um, but in terms of the communication with the contractor and with, for instance, the structural engineers, I think that was very good and worked very well. The stadium was definitely designed as, as, a, as a business that has to work for seven days a week. It can't just rely on events to support itself. So that's why we incorporated office space that could be leased out. Um, you've got all the additional areas around the stadium that could be used for the weddings and funerals and everything else and for additional sports for, um, sporting events. Um, the entire um, site is reticulated with IT and with power so you can have big markets or you can have truck launches or mini launches or whatever so there's a multitude of aspects that you can bring into the functioning of the stadium and to, into the feasibility and currently it's the only stadium that hasn't asked the government for additional money to support itself because it's got that model of um, working as a seven day a week business and they are implementing it that way and they are running it in that way at the moment. So it is managing to maintain itself, it will never be able to pay for itself, not in the South African market, but it will be able to pay for any upgrades that's required or any maintenance requirements that is there and yeah, it will still make a profit for the city, even though it is being a small profit, but it's not a it's not a liability around all of the people of Johannesburg's next, which I think was very important for us um, because you don't want to build this big white elephant that everybody frowns upon afterwards. People need to take ownership of it and appreciate what's there and needs to support itself in that sense.